right. Take three. So this is for Anthony, a member of the group, who has, uh, yeah, has a really strong desire to reclaim his mornings. I don't know if, it, if reclaim is the right word. Maybe to claim for the first time. And uh, has a sense, I think, of how powerful it could be and how powerful he would be if he took back his mornings mm. or if he not took back. You know, I think he's only 18, so probably all his life he's been getting, when he gets up early, it's probably because he has to get up early. Someone wants him to get up early. He has to go to school. His mom or dad wants him to get up and do X, Y, Z. And uh, there's something, I think, in that stage of your life, it can really be a, a breaking out and uh, uh, claiming your life for yourself mm. to have the reflection that you are acting powerfully in the world entirely of your own creation. Nothing, there's no sense that I'm doing this because I have to, I'm doing this because someone wants me to, I'm doing this to look good, I'm doing this for applause. It's, uh, I think it's, you know, the most powerful thing for Anthony here, and we, we share it, we're sharing it here because for any of you who would like to experience a, a powerful transformation. Um, it's it's like a sacred, I, th I think of it like a sacred thing. And even beyond like what you and I did, you know, we're doing it together and we're going to the beach in the morning. It could be a next level of powerful and sacred. And especially for a young man who's really breaking through for the first time. Like, it could be a sacred act of this life is my life, and it could be entirely private. It doesn't need to be public in any uh, sense. And there's a way that if you tell everyone, and then everyone has their ideas about it, and you can imagine what they're thinking about it, that, that suddenly it becomes not this sacred this thing. Yeah. And... Uh, <coughs> So I asked Anthony, what time, you know, um, could he wake up in the morning that would really have him feeling powerful? And he said 5 a.m. And so, you know, anyone out there who's, who's interested in this, we, don't, we only have a few minutes here, but I just wanted to give people a sense of it. Um, and maybe I can do that by sharing what I did for years, my morning ritual for years, which was, first of all, I, and this is all, this is all related to the power of reflection. So our mind is always reflecting back to us. I wouldn't say always, but on a regular basis, reflecting back to us who we are in the story of life or in the story of our life. And, uh, and, and so we are, we're somehow stuck in this story that's already been created. We wake up into this story about who am I and what's true and whatever. And then we just react to that story and we make choices inside of that story and we have our feelings inside of that story. But this has to do with going one step back and, and creating the, the automatic story-making apparatus that then we find ourselves living in. It's mm. a next level of power. And um, so I designed a morning ritual for myself with this, with this awareness in my mind. And the idea behind it is, <clears throat> first of all, I chose a ridiculous early hour to wake up. I was waking up at 3.55 in the morning. Um, and I was living in an office. 
The whole thing was an office. Everything was designed for reflection. Above my, in my back office, at front office, a hallway with the bathroom and the kitchen, and then the back office. The whole thing was an office. The whole thing was about building uh, my business, my work, my vision, everything. It's like just a reflection of total dedication. There was no sofa. There was no TV. There was, this was not a place for a guy who's just hanging out and just life is passing him by, and he's just enjoying himself. Upstairs were kids in university who were partying until maybe four in the morning. And just, you know, these guys would, I had a, um, a landscaping business for during this time. And um, I, mean, I won't share the whole context, but, um, you know, these guys sometimes would come to work with me and they were, their level of power personal power was like way down here whereas mine was way up here there was like for me there was there was no room for weakness no room for self-doubt no room for excuses no like there was just no room for anything that could give me a reflection that i was less than totally powerful we have a, a lot of noise in the, in the maybe hans we can uh, just rescue our our people here and come inside all the dogs and the garbage truck going by The way, the way I was designing my entire life it was to give me the reflection of being ultimately powerful and it was incredibly transformative for me personally and then I would go on to share it with my you know with my brothers but um, the way I did everything creates a uh, create it just creates a, the way you do everything creates a certain reflection about who you are mm -hmm. and um, so my mornings were like this. First of all, I, I, I slept on a sleeping bag because there was no bed in my office either. It was like no place to like just lay down and re relax. So when I'm going to sleep, which was maybe around 11 or midnight, um, I would unroll a sleeping bag in my office, put down a pillow. I would go to sleep. And my, my alarm's going to go off at 3.55 a.m., when it goes off, there is no hitting the snooze because it's, uh, it's the reflection. Like To get a sense of what kind of reflection is being generated, ask yourself what kind of person would set their alarm and what, say what time they want to get up or they're getting up and then hit the snooze. You know, That's the reflection. So, um, so it goes off. And, and the idea, like, I don't even have to, there's no space to even think, what do I feel like doing? Um, the more that you can be unconscious about your, your ritual, especially your morning ritual, um, the more powerful it is. So, um, and the, the challenge is I have to be out the door in a full, full on sprint uh, before the clock turns 410 in the morning. And it's a very tight window. Like, I have to get up at 3.55 to do it. I have a very tight window. And, um, you know, I have all these things I just do ritualistically. You know, take a piss, half a glass of water, da 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 Headphones, you know, rage against the machine. And I'm out the door, and then I'm, I'm in a full-on sprint. It doesn't matter the weather. It doesn't matter what I feel, it doesn't matter. There's no external or internal circumstance that, that interferes with the ritual. I'm a machine. And what would happen is, you know, you could say like, I, I'm so like almost half asleep in the morning, but I'm going through with this ritual nonetheless. I'm not, I'm very consciously 
thinking about the next thing and the next thing and the next, the next thing and the next thing and, and, and my movements. And I'm not stopping to think about what am I doing today or what, what do I feel like doing or like, like eliminating self-consciousness. And so, um, raise against the machine, full on running, you know, <sighs> and it would, and when, the more that you do this, the less frequently the reflections come. It's like a reflection is like a snapshot of like, it's, it's not a story. It's just a, imagine you take a snapshot of, of yourself doing, being less than powerful. It's like that. It's, and so anyway, the less conscious you are, the more it slows down these reflections. And there might be a moment where like, I'm running, like I'm running down the drag. You probably know the drag in Austin. Mm -hmm. It's the middle of the night. And I just have a sense of this image, this guy running. <laughs> and it's like, it's me. And it gives me that reflection. And it's, I don't know, it's, it's uh, and then again and again, and then like, a bum on the street will look at me, will like be startled or something, and then it'll remind me again, like I'm seeing my, I, I have self awareness again, and uh, and it's like that, and so not only do I have the rage against the machine blasting in my whatever, and my my run is like it's at the edge of my ability, I'm pushing myself the entire way, so I'm tr I'm my consciousness is so used up by maintaining deep rhythmic breathing while pushing myself at the very edge. So I'm not judging myself how tired am I, how much do my legs hurt, anything else. It's just how fast can I go while maintaining this breath. So my consciousness is being used up by all this doing the ritual mm. properly. And there's less time to think about anything like how do I feel and what do I, you know. So, um, and I think a lot of our our lives, we, we learn to guide ourselves by like, what do I feel like doing? And if you live in a world where the power is outside of you, you know, your religious leaders, your parents, school authorities, your boss, other people, then you often are feel like, eh, I, don't really, I don't feel like it. And if someone else wants you to do something, and you're, you're measuring yourself by how do you feel. And so that's often, um, I was very much shamed in the world when, when me and, in 97, me and my brothers, when I was in, in kind of inducting them into this way of life, you know, uh, it's like, hey, what do I feel like doing? <laughs> you know, we shamed that kind of appeal to what do I feel like doing? Um, and, uh, yeah, so, okay, so everything was precise. So I, there's a turnaround point, and I know that I can go the, the extra distance if I want. But I never question what road am I taking, what path am I taking. There's very little choices in there. If I want to go for the extra, I can go to the extra destination. Um, and, and again, I'm running full out. And then when I come back... I always finish with a sprint and it's like, it's one of the, like, this is it's so great. Like, I don't know the feeling and the reflection of just like, imagine it's four Oh eight or no, wait, it's uh, maybe, maybe 10 minutes later, four twenty in the morning, you know, and you're running through West campus, which is just, if there's anyone awake, it's drunk students stumbling back to their fraternity or whatever. It's maybe a police car, it's a bum, or it's the trash guys picking up the trash. And just fucking out of nowhere, you fucking turn the corner in a bun. Just like as hard as you can fucking go in the rage blasting and, you know, shirtless and shaved head and just, just, it's with everything you fucking got. And the idea is like, you generate the most powerful reflection that you could have. Like, no weakness. There's no, like, I feel a little bit tired, so I'm going to run a little bit less. Or no, it ain't any sign of weakness or self-doubt comes up. You go fucking harder. And then you finish. So I finished with a sprint, full-on sprint. 
and I can't stop, I don't stop until I know that I've crossed the finish line. Most people when they're running, even running a race, people will often stop just a little bit before the finish line. And to me it's such a negative reflection, you know. It's so much more powerful to know 100% that not only did you to have no doubt that you went as hard as you fucking could to the finish line, but beyond the finish line. And to know that you have to go at least a few steps beyond the finish line. Um, so, so when you choose the ritual, because that's, I think, is a, is a great key question you have there. You're choosing your ritual thinking, like you ask Anthony, what would be a powerful reflection? Or what would, what did you ask him? What time would be? Yes. What would time have him would... feel really powerful or, or, yeah. So that's how you design but the ritual. But give him a powerful reflection, yes. So that's how you design the ritual. When you set it up, you say, what can I do that will give me the reflection of the powerful man that I want to be? Yes. Right. Yes. Now, in the years since, like I did that, sort of thing for years um in the years since like like right now it's it's not exactly like that you know we wake up and we walk to the beach and it's beautiful in the sun and like all this and that's also great but i th i think for a young man mm -hmm. who has not yet identified himself as warrior like knowing that in the face of anything there's nothing that fucking stops him. And it's so powerful, man. It's so powerful. That's kind of why I, you know, we started doing this, this Facebook Live to the whole audience and like anyone could see it, women and whatever. And we kind of did it in a lackadaisical sense. And I just felt like, no, I don't, I, I, something, something's off here. And I realized it's just because I, I really hold this sacred. And um, I just wanted to share it in that, with that full sense mm -hmm. of its power. What I hear in the story is, is like what I was, what really struck me was the idea of like, you don't let self-consciousness come in. Whereas what we're doing now, I would say, you know, is more, uh, or at least my ritual is very samurai-like, which brings attention to every move, consideration and awareness to every move. Yes. You know, even self-awareness. Like uh, I'm getting up in the morning, I'm I'm self-aware, you know, and uh, but what you're proposing for a younger man is different. Or, well, even now with you, imagine that your ritual was so precise, every movement, and like like imagine some kind of really mm -hmm. sacred religious ritual where everything ha and it takes all of your concentration to think what's happening next and what's happening over here and like all this there'd be far less time to even yes. pay attention to who am I, what do I feel, or whatever. Actually, that's way more the, that's the unfettered mind, you know? That's the, that's the, the attention, in fact, I said self-awareness, but it's not true. It's not self-awareness, it's, it's attention to the ritual. It's attention to the ritual, and, and like you have it even in aesthetic forms in Japanese with, with the rimpa, for example, where you, you focus so much on the ritual itself, the form itself, and they speak of emptiness. It's an emptiness because you're not self-reflecting. You're not going back, how do I feel about this? Yes. You know, there's an emptiness that comes. It's almost like you are the ritual. Yes. That's the emptiness they talk about. And it's also, uh, if you've read the book Flow, I think that's the name of it. Uh, but he talks about this. Um, this state of mind where you lose self-consciousness. So, so think of a mountain climber climbing without ropes or whatever. Mm -hmm. Your attention, awareness, consciousness is needed 100.0% on the task at hand. You can't stop to take yourself out to look at yourself. See how high you climb. Because the <laughs> self-consciousness in a way, it's like, taking a step back from the immediate present moment. And uh, you, you, there's no time for that. That's interesting. Because you can imagine being in a completely safe space on a mountain, say, and you say, fuck, you know, if I, if I fall here, I die. Right. But it's not really dangerous. 
like in any other situation, you know, you're not gonna, you're not gonna trip. So it's the it's the self consciousness that brings doubt and the you know? doubt and the fear. Yeah. Yes. It's not like, like Zanza, you're not afraid to fall. You're afraid you're gonna jump. You become aware of you, <laughs> and like, what am I gonna do here? But it's in in effect not more dangerous. It's not dangerous. It's the self reflection that yes. brings the whoa. Yes. Yes. That's interesting. Yeah, I remember I took my brothers out. Uh, you, you know those bridges that go across Lake Austin, yes. Town Lake down there. I think they call it Lady Bird Lake now. But um, and we went up on the the undergirder to steel beams or whatever underneath the bridge, and there's these steel beams going across, and like you're way above the water, and we're out there going out, crawling, and and going around posts and like. And it's dangerous. It's really dangerous. And but what was I, I? What I was instructing my brothers to do was like, you don't make any move until you feel hundred percent safe. So you try your hand here. Am I am I safe? Yes. Okay. But there's, but there's, the point is there's ways of using your mind that allow you to do things without the fear that you would normally have. And and it's not just fear but it's it's almost as if we put ourselves in a certain story as well like the you who you've been being would be afraid to do what you're doing now right because he can't do it he in his world in his story he can't do it and so the idea is to not bring up that story to not create that mm. story and that story is created through reflection narration position you know, all these things that are in the inner conflict diagram. And so the idea is you're just, you know, your consciousness is 100% taken up by the task at hand. And, um, yeah, so... How did you, how did you, like, you set up the ritual? Like, the next day, if you recall, the first day you did it. I don't recall that. Well, okay. I'm wondering how, like, the how-to, you know? Because this could sound like, yeah, I know how to do this. I know. How do you get to that first day and you start doing it? Because there's a, still a decision that has to be made. There's a decision for you to have to be made. Like, not. Where did you get the the Where did you get the complete commitment to finishing the ritual? The, for me, I think part of it was the reflection was so powerful. No, no. The first time you didn't have any reflection. No, no. But even think of Anthony. Right. If he's, like, who, like Im imagine what he might think about the person that gets up by 5 a.m., right? And does this, and does, like, like, like what kind of fucking So you got so inspired by that image that the first day... It's attractive. You just went. It's, it's right. fucking attractive. Like, right, right. And so it gives you the reflection of being this fucking motherfucking powerful Even before person. you did it. Yes. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Yes. And so that's kind of the idea behind it is is created so that it's right. so exciting to wake up to, you know? Um, and if you morning. don't, it's your system that needs improvement. It's not you. You're not at fault. Yeah, so the way I approach it, and, and over time to make it last and make it become more powerful and adaptable, um, you don't, if you're not doing it, you don't judge yourself. You upgrade your system. And this is why the morning integration ritual is so powerful. I'm sure in the morning, in the beginning, I didn't have anything called a morning integration ritual. I, you know. Um, but, uh, yeah, you know, you, you have some really powerful mornings like that. And it's, it's addictive, man. It's like, you, you, and, and also, like, the reflection also comes when, like, you know, one of the college students, he's he's coming home or whatever, and he's like, "Hey, man, did we see you running this morning at four a.m.? Like, fuck, just, I I thought I saw you, you know." And it's like, yeah, yeah, you know, and and they're like, you know, you see, people change their idea about you. They change. They're like, who is this guy? You know, and them, you can see it. There, and it can almost be, um, 
the more outrageous it is, like, like there's, why you're doing it does not fit into the story of who you've been being. It doesn't make logical sense to the guy who you've been being in life, to the role that you've been acting mm -hmm. out. But maybe it makes 100% sense to the guy you're going to be 20 years from now who is, who is limitless, you know? And so you, you start living as that ultimate powerful man. Mm -hmm. um, yes. you, you did it alone. For me, what has been key, at least this time around, is that, uh, well, you're there. I have an ally who, and I won't uh, be damned if I don't get up. You know? yeah. Like, there's no way that I will not get up yeah. because you're up also. What? Well, you know, like, I, as, as I'm thinking back about it, I, I know I was getting into running and stuff before my youngest brother came out. But when my youngest brother came out, I, th I think also, like, I, I wasn't, okay, so I didn't start off, like, running at 3.55 in the morning. That was maybe after a couple of years, maybe a year or two of doing something else. But I remember when my, my little brother came out, we would, uh, we would get up at the time when all the students are, they're on the drag, they're, they're going to university, you know, and they're all like, uh, and, the, and from our perspective, it's like, these people are reluctantly going to do what they're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. And we're fucking sprinting down the drag for no reason that anyone else is good. It's our parents, and no, no one in society doesn't expect us. We're 100% creating our life, 100%. And we're fucking fired up about it. And it's just a reflection of like people looking at you like, <laughs> who are these guys, you know? Partly that was really powerful as well. And that may, that probably took it for me to the next level of doing that with him for, mm. you know, and, and like my brother, he never, you know, he wasn't a runner, he wasn't whatever. All of a sudden he's there with his older brother, you know, he's getting in, he's never heard Raised Against the Machine before, you know, and, and he's just instantly becoming a badass hanging out with his older brother, you know, <laughs> so... For him as well, as a younger guy, there was, um, so I just want to, I want to echo what you're saying. The brotherhood factor, the ally factor is powerful. And it, so if you can join another brother in that, the thing is, you don't want to do it with someone who's just a friend, who's like, yeah, you didn't know, let, let, I don't really feel like doing it today. And you know, you do not want to be hanging out with guys who guide their life like a fucking vagina <laughs> you know like a pussy you know and and for us like that's that's uh we really there was a clear distinction we looked down on all the guys that were just kind of half ass in life and eh, I, don't, eh, I don't feel like it you know so um yeah, I'm, I mean, it's, I'm glad you're asking me these questions because I'm, um, I'm looking back to map on, you know, kind of how it all started and stuff. But uh, my, my youngest brother was coming from, he actually dropped out of high school to come and live with me. And, um, and in high school, he was looked down upon as a loser. He was hanging out with the guys that weren't going anywhere. They were just into drugs. They were shooting BB guns at school buses. They were just, you know showing up half the time, half the time not, and uh, going nowhere with their lives. And so they're getting the reflection, you can imagine, they're going, they're getting the reflection every day that they're losers, that they don't give a fuck, that they're blah, you know. And I realized because understanding the power of reflection, what's gonna happen to my youngest brother if he stays in that situation long enough. He's gonna believe that shit about himself and that's gonna affect the rest of his fucking life. And so I realized, fuck that, John, you come out here and I'll show you the way to be a powerful man, essentially. And so when he came, I inducted him into a way of life that was just like ultra powerful. And so for him, he went from one way of life 
to another that was like a drastic difference. But on the, on the level of like status and pride and pow, personal power, confidence, it, it went from like boom to boom, you know? And it was, it's, it's, it's a high, it's addictive. When, when you do that, make that kind of a leap, it's like, oh, it feels good, man. You don't want to fucking give that up. And you don't want to be one of those guys who's living like you used to live, right? Like all those other people. So part of it, I'm thinking about it now, part of it was like, kind of like an extreme pride in being levels above all the other guys who were just kind of going through life half-assed, not mm -hmm. totally their own creation. So what would you recommend to Anthony, tying it back in? Well, I think one of the most powerful choices he could make would be to come and come out here to Brazil, make that, yeah, there's fear involved, but come and live with us, wake up with us, go through the rituals with us, and get the reflection of being as dedicated, as high level, as committed, as whatever, as us, so that that's the reflection he gets all day long, every day, and that in itself is going to be transformed. Not even to speak of the power of being on that plane. Sitting in the plane, coming over here, what the fuck am I doing? Yes. <laughs> I'm going yes. the other side of the world. Well, and it's going to transform how everyone else thinks of him, how everyone else knows him, how his parents know him, everything else. How now, the guys of this group think about him. And when it comes to the, uh, you know, let me say this. So the, the Maasai in Kenya and, and Tanzania, the Maasai warriors, when they're of warrior age, which is somewhere... The way they do it, they don't actually keep track of people's years they are when they're born. But every so often, maybe every like seven, eight years, something like this, there'll be a new warrior class. So everyone who was not part of the last warrior class and like there may be, they've already hit puberty, right? <coughs> this is maybe everyone from like, it could be 12 to 21 or something like this. They all leave together. They all go through a ritual. They all leave the tribe. And they go out into the, the wild. And they can't come back until they've killed a lion. And uh, I think... I, 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 I'm actually not up to date on this, but... I don't know... So, so, but they'll go and they'll do it together. And the guy who spears it first, the first guy to spear it, like he's known, he's respected, he's going to get, when they go back, it's going to be him that gets the women. It's going to be him that gets the status. And for the rest of his life, he's known that way. <laughs> you know, so imagine how powerful that would be to be known as the fucking man, right, in the group of guys. It's, it's like that. How you make your mark at this early age is how everyone's going to know you. And it's, it's why it's so powerful to do it early. Um, it's so powerful to do, to do something really powerful early. And you'll see a lot of guys, they'll, they'll, guys have a sense of this. They want to prove themselves. They want to test themselves. They'll go and join a gang. And to join the gang, they'll, they'll have to do some violent act or scary act or whatever to prove that they're man enough. And then once you do it, now you're part of the gang. There's such a more powerful reflection about who you are because you not very few people could do or would do what you did. But now that you're part of the gang, you're with everyone else who has done what you did. Mm -hmm. So you're at this higher level. And uh, it's a powerful thing. Um, it's a really powerful thing. So... Um, yeah, to, 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 to be in modern life and to have no great challenges like this to, and to be able to join no great tribe of warriors, warrior brothers like this. You know, nowadays they, they, they include women in everything. They make, uh, they, they, they take everything down to a level to where the women feel comfortable and where the women are not offended and whatever. And there is no separate warrior class. You know, even the military, they're bringing women into the military, even into the elite military. 
They're lowering the standards, the physical standards of what it takes to get into the military. How less attractive is it now for a man to say that I became part of this elite group of SEALs when the, when the standards have been lessened, right? Or even when there's females present, you know? And, you know, if you're a guy listening to this who's been brought up in a feminized world, you might say, oh, that's kind of sexist, <laughs> you know, Michael Sky. But the dynamic is there for a guy who wants to be a powerful guy. There is something really powerful about joining a group of an elite brotherhood that doesn't involve women, period. You know, you can, you can make whatever you want of it, but uh, the fact that we have so few of those all-male spaces, warrior brother spaces anymore, is a real tragedy. Mm. Um, or that we have men, older men, that we really admire, respect, and look up to. That, that, that it's a tragedy that young men often have no men that they know in their immediate surroundings with a guy like that who they also feel gives a fuck about him, you know? That we have a, we're impoverished with that. And so if you're a young guy now, I would say fight for it. Fight to go and have that. To be amongst and to, to be an apprentice with or to, to be a mentee with powerful men who you respect and admire who are going to hold you to a high standard who also give a fuck about you. Like both of those things are ultra powerful, as is the force of honor to guide you. So these these you know these things, in fact, are um, for me what's underlying Project Ronin is. This is actually probably the first podcast that we've really done that, it, that it's it's along the lines of what I really want to be doing with this podcast. I think is is for these younger guys to give them a sense of what's the wealth the natural wealth that they would have if they belonged to some kind of enduring human tribe or population that's, that's not, you know, the world we have now is designed to make us comfortable essentially as slaves to a corporate elite and to an elite class and to just be comfortable going along with their program, right? We get trained in nine to five school that makes it easy for us to go into a nine to five job. You know, it, like the whole thing is set up to, to so it works for the people mm -hmm. who profit from it the most. And um, my invitation is realize the wealth, the natural wealth, elders, brotherhood, honor, uh, a role of honor for your people. A role as a war, every man should in some way have a chance to be a warrior early on in his life. And, you know, yeah, so to realize what they're missing and that feeling, ah, something's not right, I'm not fully alive. I, eh. I mean, isn't it fucked up that there's maybe nothing calling to you you know, that call to, 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 to a battle to fight, uh, an adventure to live, uh, a uh, beauty to rescue, and warrior brothers to fight alongside of, that you don't have that in your everyday life, so you ha have to go play a video game to get that feeling. Mm. That the natural world is less exciting to you, less alive to you than a fucking video game. That's a tragedy. I don't, I don't blame the guys who get into the video games. Uh, just pay attention. Your desire says, I want to come alive like this. Well, if you're, the life that you're living and the things that you're signed up for, whether that's university or the nine to five job and the blah, 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 blah. When you look around, you see everyone else is living this normal life. So you say, well, I guess there's something wrong with me if I don't, if I'm not turned on by this normal life. No, it's, Honor your tazao. Honor what makes mm. you come alive. And if it's not in your natural environment, go seek it out and, and go make that adventure happen. Go find or start a group of warrior brothers. Go find or become the elder that you don't have, the elders that you don't have in your life. Make, reclaim this. Mm. Um, and you, you might have to, you're probably going to have to do it in the face of all those normal people out there who are 
um, entranced in this, entranced <laughs> in this culture, culture that that makes you feel okay about being a lesser man, about compromising your power, compromising your honor, compromising your authority, and just going along with, going along to get along. And uh, yeah, I feel it's a, it's a crisis moment in those early years, in those warrior years, 12 to 21, let's say. I feel it's a real, like, you forge your fucking warrior identity then, or you're gonna pay the price later on. Or you got a much bigger fight on your hands later on in life. Yes. I feel it's a real crisis. And I, while we're having this conversation, I'll, I'll say also that I wanna say this about authority because we have a fucked up relationship to authority where authority is something outside of you. This is like the current modern civilized Western way of relating to authority, that it's somewhere outside of you and that it's someone with a position who can make, make you do something even if you don't feel like doing it. And then we, we internalize this external authority to guide ourselves. And this was 100% fucked up. It, it steals our power. It steals our honor. It steals the warrior self that we could be and the creator self that we could be and how I invite guys listening to this to relate to authority is, and this is much more of a Native American relationship to, to authority, is the way I'm going to present it, is authority is yours to grant. Meaning, for example, I give you the authority to speak for me because I feel like 100% you know me, you care, you give a fuck about me, you're willing to fight for me, and you're not going to betray me, right? And, and a chief, a ch you know, we might think of like Indians and chiefs and all this sort of thing. A chief wasn't this guy who was like king or voted in or whatever, has this power um, over you. Someone's not your chief if you don't feel in your heart that they speak for you. The moment that you don't feel they speak for you, they're not your chief. So authority is something you grant. You are the one with the power. No one outside of you. And it's such a powerful way to live your life. And so if there's an external authority making you feel guilty or ashamed because you're not doing what they think you should do to be responsible, fuck them. That's a fucked up relationship to authority and to you. And it's, it's a violation of your sacred will, your sacred soul, your sacred authority. And your, your responsibility to yourself is to put up your boundary, say no to that, my sacred authority will not be violated. And you require of someone, if they're gonna call you into battle, into adventure, into responsibility, they need to call to your heart. They need to, they need to give you an invitation that, that's, a, that's a call to honor, a call to adventure, a, a vision, something. Mm. But if they don't bring that, then don't feel any fucking whatever to get up off the couch or to leave your whatever and go do it. You know, like if I, if, if my call to Anthony does not speak, does not call him up to come here and he feels like I'm judging him or whatever, then he should be like, fuck you, Michael Sky. You know, I'm not coming. And, and, uh, yeah. And I, and conversely, the other side of that is I think all people who would be an authority or would be a father or an older brother, or a guide for a younger man, their, their responsibility is to lead in that way, to be the kind of man that inspires the younger man to live like you live and to give invitations, to give calls to honor, call to their heart, call to adventure in that kind of a way. Mm -hmm. So, uh, 
Yeah, what I have to say is not uh, is not very political correct, politically correct in that sense. But I feel like you know, you and I have been doing these uh, these podcasts for like I don't know four or five weeks, and uh, I kind of feel like only today have I really started saying like what my real kind of stand, what my real stand is mm -hmm. for young men, and um, yeah, and it, there's danger out there in the real world beyond. Beyond the, beyond the pale. Yeah, you just come here to the seas. The waves this morning were already dangerous. <laughs> yeah. Fuck. Yeah, the ocean is uh, dangerous ocean. and quite unpredictable. The ocean was wild that day, my friends. So. Anything more? Oh, there's a lot more. Stay tuned. <laughs> that was great. <laughs>